Well, good morning and welcome to this webinar. My name is Simon Ritter. I'm the Deputy CTO at Azure Systems. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is microservices and how you can look at the performance of microservices, specifically in relationship to the use of Java and how Kubernetes fits into all of that and Docker and all those good things. So if we get started, essentially what we're looking at here is a change to the way software development has taken place. And if, you know, in my history, I look back at how we used to develop software, you know, we use different methodologies, but most of it was this approach of a sort of waterfall style where we would do all of the design up front, then we would do all of the development, then we would do all of the testing, and then we'd release the product. And it was monolithic, so it was a big piece of software, everything in one thing. And clearly, as we've seen over the last few years, we've shifted away from that to the idea of microservices. And if we look at the sort of basics of microservices, you know, the microservice architecture is how you take a big monolithic thing and you break it up into a number of discrete components. Those components then talk to each other and how you deploy those components, those services can be as flexible as you want. So you can deploy it on premises, you can deploy it into the cloud, you can mix, you can match, you can have cross cloud, all of those sorts of things. But the essential thing here that we're dealing with is a fundamental thing that we've been doing for a long, long time, and that's distributed computing. And so it's, as I said, the idea where we, we put different components on different machines and have them linked together so that those things can work together to give us the result that we want. Now, obviously, distributed computing has been around for a long time, and there's been all sorts of different attempts to make that work and make it easy to deliver. So, you know, things like Corba, things like DCOM, all of those sort of um, RPC, even if you go all the way back. So what is it that has really kind of driven the popularity and the success of a microservice architecture? And really there are a number of things that have come together to, to do that. The first of those is a move away from, as I said, this old waterfall style of approach to development to an agile, way of doing things. So it's this idea that rather than doing all the design up front, you're doing it in an iterative way so that if most likely the requirements change whilst you're doing the development. And certainly again, you know, in my experience, when you're working on a very big project that takes a long time to complete, the chances are that requirements will change over that time. So if you've done all of the design and analysis in advance, it's very hard to adapt to changes. With an agile approach, you can do it iteratively so you can redesign around the fact that the requirements have changed and so you can adapt to that as the software is being developed. So agile methodology is very important to this kind of thing. The second thing is the whole idea of DevOps and avoiding this distinction between development and operations. And again, you know, this is the sort of thing that makes it very easy to adapt to frequent changes so that we can deliver on what the requirements are as the requirements change. So rather than a big team of developers hands over the final product to the operations department, they then deploy it, they then maintain it and make sure everything's running. It's about developers and operations being merged so that, you know, developers can be in a situation where they can deploy to a production system without the need to go through an operations department. And the third piece, which kind of relates to the DevOps side of things, is the tooling that we now have to do that. And that's all around this idea of continuous integration and continuous deployment. So things like Jenkins, things like Puppet and Chef that allow you to automate tasks when it comes to saying, okay, I'm a developer, I've completed my microservice, I've got it ready to go, I've got my jar file or whatever, I need to then deploy it. Tooling such as Jenkins integrated with the IDE using scripts from Chef or Puppet and then being able to set all that up so that the developer can go, okay, I've finished, compiles run, I've done my unit tests, the tests are all complete, I can then just hit one click, deploy, everything is set up so that it ends up in the cloud or on-premises. So this is really the, the kind of key components that have helped to drive the popularity of microservices. And again, if we look at the sort of approach, it is very much about divide and conquer. 
So rather than having a monolithic piece of software where everything is essentially encapsulated into a single entity. And even if you look at some of the Java enterprise side of things, if you think about uh, the old J2EE way of doing things and using an application server, even though you would have components in that, such as servlets and enterprise Java beans, yes, that was sort of breaking things up into to different um, services, if you like, different components, but they were still running within that container. And yes, you know, you could divide them across different application servers, but that was a lot harder. And so with microservices now, it is very much about breaking things up in a way that makes those components small, easy to manage, and the interfaces between them are well defined. So if we look at the sort of architecture of this, and then we can start getting into the idea of how, where performance comes in. So now, if we look at the, the kind of architecture we've got, we're delivering things primarily into the cloud. As I say, yes, we, we can certainly do it into our own data center, but very much the goal is to deliver things into the cloud so that we can pay only for the services we use. We don't have to provision an entire data center. We let somebody else like Microsoft or Amazon do that. And then we simply say, I need a machine that can run with this much CPU, this much memory and so on, and deploy it onto that. And you only pay as you use it. So we end up with our, our cloud here and I've got you know, two clouds. So we've got cross cloud um, interaction here. And the idea being that obviously we've got our microservices deployed and those are the little hexagons there. And from a sort of usage point of view, the users, see exactly what the application needs to do. So from their perspective, everything is the same as if they were using monolith. They're still interacting with some kind of web page that goes through to the server, interacts with that, handles transactions, does whatever is required by the application. But from a user's perspective, they don't see anything different. From the developer's point of view, things are very different because what we've got is all these microservices and those microservices need to work together because obviously if you only have one microservice, it will be a monolith. So now we've got lots of different microservices where they will call from one service to another in order to provide the, the, the necessary functionality that the application needs to do. And so it, a lot of the design of this is around the idea of, okay, so which services do we need to link together? How do we need to link them together and so on? And then, in this case, we've got some database on the back end, so we've got connections to that as well. The advantage from the point of view of development is that we can have different teams working on different microservices. And that allows for different areas of domain expertise to be used. So one team could understand very much about you know, handling credit card, credit card transactions. Another team could understand more about how the persistence of the data works and things like that. So you can have one team working on one set of services, even a single service. You could have another team working on another set of services because their domain expertise is much more in that area. So far, this is all very well and good, and it all looks wonderful because it gives you flexibility, it gives you the ability to you know, redesign things and um, have different teams working on that. But what, what can we see in terms of, of uh, the performance of this? Now, what we might end up with is a situation where one of our microservices is a kind of key part of the thing, and suddenly what you're seeing is that because that is the, the thing that has to do most work, it becomes a bottleneck in terms of the performance of the application. Great thing about microservices is that because the services are separate and we're making calls from one service to another, there's no mandatory way of doing this. So we could actually say, okay, let's do the obvious thing and let's have a number of instances of this service and we can spin those up dynamically. So if the if the load in terms of transaction changed, di changed dynamically, and um, this is where we come into the Kubernetes side of thing, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, when it comes to the, the ability to use these services, what we can do is we can say, okay, let's spin up new instances of service so that we can shift the load across those. And clearly from a design perspective, we need to be a little bit careful when it comes to state management. So you would need to make sure that the, the state is probably external to this so that it's easy to spin up the services and still be able to use them from whichever service needs to call into that. But it is a very powerful advantage, the fact that you can dynamically start up and stop services 
within this environment to shift the, the load. So that's a really good thing. But there's a, there's a downside to this architecture, which is that if we're running our application here, from the user's perspective, obviously they send transactions to our application within the cloud. And rather than before, where the, the latency associated with the response to that uh, transaction was purely from the one system that we had, our monolith, in this case, what we see is that the latency of the application is now a result of all of the individual services and it's an aggregation of the latency so uh, you know we've got latency from service a to service b latencies from service b to service c and so on so that aggregation is something which can be an issue and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through but from an architectural point of view that's something you do need to think about so this kind of really brings me to the next thing which is you know how fine you make the granularity of your services so as I said, in terms of the the way things move through the, uh, the through the system, you're looking at the aggregate latency for all of the services that are being called. Right. So at this like this point, I'd like to ask you, the audience, a question because this is is a very interesting thing to sort of discuss. So I've given you a single question here, which is how many microservices do you have in a typical application? So I'm assuming that you are using microservices. Um, so hopefully you can answer this question. And I'll give you five different possible answers. So the first is one to five, second is six to 10, third is 11 to 20, fourth is 21 to 100, and the fifth one is 100 plus. So I just give you a couple of seconds there to answer that question. I know there's a reasonable number of people on the, on the webinar. So, okay, so if hopefully people have now had enough time to click on the button. So if we can bring up the results of that and we see, interesting. Okay, so we see here that about a quarter of the people are saying they use between one and five microservices in their typical application. A third of people, six to 10, 26%, again, about a quarter, 11 to 20, and then quite a small number in the 2100 and 100 plus. And as I say, this is very interesting because the reason I wanted to ask this question clearly demonstrates that the vast majority of people here are using of the order of like maybe a dozen or less uh, microservices in a typical application. So if I go back to my slides now, I came across a survey that had been done recently by JRebel, and they did a similar thing where they asked developers how many microservices they were using in their main application. And this was the results they get, which is kind of like what we saw in, in the results from uh, the audience here, although it is a little bit more shifted um, in terms of uh, between 6 to 10 and 11 to 25. They use slightly different numbering to me. But I think the important thing to get here is that most people are using a reasonably small number of web services. Um, certainly, you know, if you look at the results here, again, the vast majority of people are using, I'd say, you know, sort of like a dozen, maybe a few more, a dozen or less microservices within that web service. And so that that is a very critical thing when it comes to looking at the performance of things, because Again, as I said, you know, the, the idea of the cumulative latency that you get in terms of, of individual transactions, the more microservices you have, the more that uh, cumulative effect is, is going to have a, a significant impact. OK, let's talk a little bit more about, you know, the, the ideas behind microservices in terms so that we can set the scene for our, our talk about performance. So the idea with microservices is to do one thing and to do it well. And the ideas behind this really go back a long, long way. I mean, if you think back to, uh, I used to work on on Unix, and Unix really sort of started this whole idea. I'm guessing, uh, I think it did. Um, Unix kind of started this idea with the idea of being able to pipe and be able to redirect the output of commands. So you could take a command and you could redirect the output of that command into the input of another command. And so you could pipe from one command to another. And that allowed you to build up much more complex 
ways of handling things using a simpler set of tools. So you'd have things like grep, which would do pattern matching. You'd use things like find, which would locate files within a particular file system. You could use more complex tools like awk, which would do um, you know conversion between different uh, patterns and, and so on. And that was very important, the ability to build up these things from, from well-defined, smaller services. But very much this idea of, of a service doing one thing and doing it well. And I, I do think that microservices is a little bit of a, um, a bad name for this whole kind of idea, because people look at this and they think to themselves microservice and the fact that it's micro indicates small. So you immediately think of a service being small. But certainly you, the audience, seem to feel that from a service point of view, what you're dealing with is, is a reasonably small number of services. So if it's a complex application, if you have a small number of services, it's still not going to be microservices. It's more going to be um, what I would say unifunction services. And you can kind of take that even to the extreme. So if you think of a Cassandra instance, that could be a microservice because it does one thing and it does it well but it could be a microservice in terms of what you're doing in your application. Obviously, the most important thing is to have well-defined interfaces because what we're essentially dealing with here is the idea, as computer science lecturers like to put it, is um, the idea of uh, um, being able to have services which are, are closely coupled, but highly cohesive, or loosely coupled, but highly cohesive. Um, the idea of loose coupling is that you can change the implementation very easily. So our microservices can be deployed individually. So we can change where that microservice comes from, either because of load balancing or from the implementation point of view. So the coupling between them is loose in the sense that we can change that very easily. But the um, cohesion is very high in the sense that the interface between them is very well defined. And so that means if we if we change the implementation, so long as we stick to the existing interface between them and we match that, and we, we um, agree to the contract, then we can still work very easily and everything works in exactly the same way. Mostly what we see at the moment is that uh, web services will use, um, microservices will use RESTful web services as the way in, of interacting. From a deployment perspective, this is where we get into the idea of the container. So what we want to be able to do is to isolate the services, the microservices that we're providing. And we do that using Docker, typically. I mean, there are other ways of doing this, but you know, if you look at the way that most people do this, they're going to be using Docker. Docker sits on top of the host operating system and it provides, again, a standard interface to the container such that we can run our service within that. And essentially what we're doing within the Docker container is providing a lightweight operating system support in the sense that we have a standard set of system calls, a contract that we make in terms of the Docker container engine that everything in the container can use. So it knows that all those system calls are available. It knows that from the perspective of running an application, it's going to be, let's say, an Intel architecture, so it knows the instruction set being used by the, the processor and so on. So it gives us a well-defined interface that we can sit on top of. And that way we can then isolate our containers so that they can be completely separate from one another. Service A can use its own libraries, its own runtime. Service B can use potentially different libraries, different runtimes and so on, and service C the same. By isolating them, there's no interaction between them unless we want that through a well-defined interface. But from a operating system perspective underneath, there's no interaction between them. So we don't have to worry about clashes in terms of IP addresses. We don't have to worry about uh, different versions of libraries not being available in the right place because everything is contained in an isolated environment, enabling us to use that in the, the way that we want to. And then, Again, if we look at how this actually gets deployed, we have the idea of layers that we build up so that we can say, okay, our operating system in this example is gonna be an Ubuntu operating system that can make use of the system calls that we know about. So everything will work. So it's, it's looking exactly the same way. Then we can build on top of that. So we can say, okay, let's have a layer, which is our Java runtime. Then we can build on top of that. We can say, right, we're gonna be using, let's say Tomcat for our serverless engine. 
and then we can provide a layer on top of that, which is the serverless that we want to use. Okay, all well and good. So we build up our classic stack architecture. Then we create an image from that. And the key thing about the image is that all of these layers are read only. The advantage of that is that when we want to deploy this, we can deploy the, the image such that we can share the operating system, Java Runtime, Tomcat, and even the serverless if we wanted to amongst multiple containers. Even though they're gonna be doing different things from the point of view of transaction handling, they will be sharing the image. So we don't have to duplicate all of this, even if we're going to run multiple, image, multiple copies of this image on the same hardware. So all of this is read only. What we then need to do to enable the system to work is provide a writable layer on top of that, because clearly there are going to be situations where the way the service is going to work, we need to make changes to things within the, um, the image in terms of configuration or, or persisting data or, or things like that. So we need a writable layer. And then by combining the image with the writable layer, we end up with a container. When thing, things do need to be changed, we effectively use a, a copy on write type of approach. So let's say a file needs to be changed in uh, the operating system, we need to change some setting. We can write that file, but it's in the writable layer rather than the read only layer. Whenever something at the application level needs to access that file, it goes to the one that we have written rather than the one that's in the read only area. And again, that enables us to minimize the amount of space that's required for running multiple instances of the container. Obviously, we want to deploy that into the cloud. And so we've got two different approaches we can take in terms of that. First is we could say, OK, let's use infrastructure as a service where we're really just providing an operating system. So rather than deploying it onto our own data center, we're deploying it, deploying it into a, a Linux instance or a Windows instance, if you like, on a cloud. And then we can even take that a little bit further and we can say, OK, let's let's really make life simple and let's use platform as a service where somebody provides a platform that has the Docker engine already configured. And that way we can just say, I've got my container, that's the Docker engine and just deploy that onto the Docker engine and then we'll start running our application. Microservices have some challenges. OK, so we've got the idea of containers. We've got our microservices. We've got loosely coupled, highly cohesive. All this is very, very good. And as I said, the idea being that microservices, we do one thing and we do it well. However, having all this power is great, but that isn't the end of the, the story, is it? Because, yes, great. So you've got lots of containers. You've got lots of microservices. You want to deploy them. How do you go about linking everything together? And this is what we refer to as orchestration. We also have the whole issue of how do we manage the life cycle of our services? How do we start them? How do we stop them? How do we restart them? How do we monitor whether a particular service has stopped working um, and therefore we need to restart it? How do we monitor the performance of our application in terms of whether a particular service is taking too long to respond because of load? So this is where we can get into the idea of starting and stopping multiple service instances so that as the load goes up, we run more instances. As the load drops down, we can start um, phasing out some of the instances to avoid having to pay more than we need to in terms of our cloud uh, bill. So lots of things that, that the simple kind of Docker and container approach, very powerful, but doesn't provide all of the answers. This is where we get into Kubernetes. So Kubernetes then provides the answers to these questions. Now, I don't want to spend too long talking about Kubernetes because I'm sure most people here are already using it, but the idea is essentially to allow us to have a set of functionality where we can say, okay, I want to deploy my application, I want to manage it, and I want to scale it based on a set of microservices. And the way we do that is through pods. So pod is the basic scheduling unit. It allows us to have a higher level of abstraction beyond the idea of a single microservice. So we can create a pod that has a number of microservices within it. And that allows us to say, okay, rather than having, you know, three different distinct microservices that we want to, to work with, let's group those together and make that available as a single service, a single pod. We can then co-locate those on the same host. We can share resources amongst those. We can also share an IP address. We can avoid the problems of port conflicts and so on, various things like that. So there's a lot of power in providing things as a pod. 
what we then need to do is to define how we want to use that pod and how we want to use those services, how we want to link them together, how we want them to be managed from a, a service point of view and so on. So we have controllers, something to control it. We have the idea of replication controller. If we need to run multiple services, that will be the thing that will say, okay, because of the time it's taking to respond, let's in, generate, spin up new instances of this particular service. Then handle the idea of redirecting load from different microservices to these different instances. We have the idea of deployments, how we want to deploy those, where we want them to deploy to, how we want to deploy them and so on. And then the service itself is the ultimate abstraction, if you like, where we, we've got our service, which is the entire application, a set of pods that work together, how we do service discovery, so how we find the interaction between them, how we link them together in terms of networking and so on, how we route the requesting, how we do the load balancing, all those sort of things. So Kubernetes provides the magic that sits above the microservices in order to make everything work in the way that we want it to. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how Java fits into this whole idea of microservices, because clearly what I've spoken about so far, nothing about that is Java specific. You could deploy microservices in any language that you like. What about if we want to use Java to do that? Well, obviously, from the point of view of using containers, there are a number of advantages that we can have in terms of using a container. First is we can isolate JVMs from each other. And that means that if we're creating our individual services, we don't have to worry about a central JDK that we might have installed on our machine. And if you think about the way things have worked in the past, that seems to be the way that we've done it. So we would install the JDK, it would go in, you know, slash opt somewhere or, or whatever. And then applications would use that JDK. They just simply set Java home to where that was and off they would go. That's all well and good, except if people start updating the JDK on that machine, suddenly you might find that there are issues because that particular service relies on something in a version of the JDK and something changes, especially now we're seeing with JDK 9 onwards that things are being removed from the JDK as well as added to it, that could become an issue. So by having isolation, having the container have the JRE as part of the, the, the writable layers, then we can make sure that each service only has the JDK that it needs. Now, one of the great things about JDK 9 and onwards is that we have modularity. And the sort of big advantage of that is that now we can use this JLink command to create a runtime which is specific to the application that we're developing. Very good for microservices because what we do is we build our microservice and then we use JLink to analyze the dependencies that that service has on the JRE itself. And that way we can say, okay, we only need these modules, build a runtime that only includes those particular JDK modules, plus the ones for the service itself. By using some other flags, we can do things like stripping the symbol table, we can eliminate manual pages, all of those types of things. And what that allows us to do is to shrink the, the runtime from literally hundreds of megabytes, because a full JDK is I think about 350, maybe 400 megabytes, down to tens of megabytes, depending on how many modules we need from the JDK itself. So that allows us to, to have a, a much more stripped down, tailored runtime for our application, because we're deploying it in a container, we can run all of our tests on that and make sure that everything works with that particular deployed JDK, JRE, and therefore we don't have to worry about people changing things elsewhere in the system. It's all tied into our container. Typically, um, when we're deploying into a container, we would use a single jar, but that's not a requirement. It's just a, a simple thing there. And the other thing that's really good is because you may well have a, an environment where you want to have microservices, which some of which are built in Java, some of which are built in Node.js, some of which are built in Go, things like that. So you have different um, services built in different languages. And the nice thing is that by using this, you can have consistent deployment between your Java-based microservices and your non-Java-based microservices. It all looks exactly the same from the point of view of deployment, even from testing and so on. So that's the advantages of containers. When it comes to the JVM running within the container, what we're relying on is the underlying functionality of the 
Linux operating system. And there's a couple of things that it uses. One is C groups, um, the other, another one is namespaces and so on. C groups had been a bit of an issue for the JDK up until JDK 10. And in fact, the functionality for that was also backported to JDK 8 as of update 191. And the reason for that was that when you started the JVM, even within a container, because the container was using C groups to limit the resource utilization in terms of how much memory was available and, and how many cores and so on, the JVM wasn't actually respecting the C group limits. So it was actually going to the operating system and saying how much memory is in the operating system, not how much memory is in the C group in which I'm running. And that could have led to a situation where you had a heap space that would be bigger than the amount of memory that was allocated to your container. When you went beyond that, it didn't die gracefully, it would just stop completely. And so that would be a real issue for the you know, availability of your microservices. As I said, from JDK 10 onwards and JDK 8 update 191, the ability to be C group aware has now been avail made available in the JVM. So it now does respect the requirements of that. And so everything works quite nicely. When it comes to con configuring your container, you do need to think carefully about how much memory to give to your container, because you might look at it and go, well, okay, so I'm going to have a heap space of, I don't know, let's say one gigabyte in my, for my, um, microservice. So I will set the memory for my microservice, the C group of that container, to be one gigabyte, maybe a little bit more. But that's not actually the right thing to do because, of course, you've got to remember that the container has to have the memory for the rest of the JVM. And there are a number of different things that, that will increase the requirement of the JRE in terms of memory from the container. Native JRE, actually the JRE itself, the JVM, needs some memory to run. JIT bytecode is going to be an issue because as the JIT runs, it's going to generate bytecode that requires memory. NIO, um, if you're doing native IO, things like that, then you may have mapped buffers, all sorts of things like that. Threads, stack, all these things need to be accounted for when you determine how much memory to allocate for your container in order to run your JVM. Challenges for a Java environment running a microservice within a container. So the first thing is responsiveness under load. So what you don't want to do is to find that as you increase the load, the pause times increase, the latency associated with your um, application increases. And as I've said in the earlier part of the presentation, this can be hard to, to actually analyze because when you look at the the load within the microservices, you've got to look at not just a single monolithic application and measuring how much performance you get through that, but you've got to measure the performance of each individual microservice in the chain that builds up the sequence of events that processes your transaction. So you may well define a service level agreement for each individual microservice, but again, it's this idea of the cumulative or aggregate of the latency of these different things. So your service level agreements are going to be quite complex in terms of trying to figure out how to ensure that the overall latency for your application in terms of responding to a, a customer is within the limits because you've got to figure out all the different parts of the microservices that are being used and how they impact on that. Same thing with in terms of supporting multiple JVMs on the same physical hardware. Okay, we're using containers. How do we make efficient use of the resources? How do we figure out the allocation for peak load? How do we figure out the, the normal load and so on? So there's, there's a number of things you need to consider there. And then the first, last thing, uh, especially for Java, is the ability to spin up services quickly. Because if you want scalability and you really do want to have this ability to change quickly to an, or adapt quickly to a changing load, then you need to be able to start up services quickly so that they're available and you don't have to wait. So how do we, how do we address these issues with Zing? So Zing is a JVM that we have developed at Azul. And it is based on OpenJDK source code. So we, we take exactly the same source code that's used for Hotspot. We take the OpenJDK source code and, and that's our starting point. What we do is we make some changes to that in terms of how it works internally. But the important thing is that it does pass all of the Java SE, TCK, JCK tests. So from the point of view of 
using Zing rather than using an open JDK build, it is very much a drop-in replacement for another JVM. So you don't have to worry about recoding. You don't have to worry about recompiling your code to work with Zing. It is very much just a different JVM that you can simply say, okay, I've got my jar file. I'll deploy Zing into my container rather than OpenJDK and everything will work in exactly the same way. Pretty much the only thing you do have, to, well, you don't even really need to change, but the thing that you can change is the command line flags because there are literally less command line flags that you will need on Zing than you will on Hotspot. The reason for that is that we only have one garbage collector. It's called C4. So we take out all of the ones that are in OpenJDK, the serial, parallel, CMS, G1, all of those are removed and we use a single one called C4. The other thing we've done is to replace the C2 JIT compiler with one that we call Falcon. And I'll explain a little bit more about what these things do in a moment. And then the last thing we do is we also add in what's called ReadyNow, which is a warm-up elimination technology. Again, I'll explain what that actually does, because that obviously is very important from the point of view of microservices. Okay, so from the point of view of C4 Garbage Collector, this is a truly pauseless collector. So that means that we do not pause application threads in order to do large chunks of work for the garbage collector. So it's different to things like G1, it's different to things like CMS and so on. It eliminates the impact of garbage collection on latency. And so again, if we're thinking about microservices and the idea of the latency is the aggregate of all the different uh, microservices involved in a transaction, then being able to eliminate the, the latency associated with garbage collection will make your life a whole lot easier when you're trying to figure out how to minimize latency across the transaction being processed. Um, one of the things we've done more recently is to reduce the minimum heap size associated with um, C4. So in the past, we've suggested a minimum of one gigabyte as heap size. Now we've reduced that to 512 megabytes. This is one of those things that comes up when we talk about microservices. And so does microservice really mean small? Um, yes, some people are using microservices that have you know, very small heaps, but Again, thinking about the, the survey results, if you've got an application that's only using, you know, uh, maybe a dozen or so microservices, it may well be that your heap size for each of those is still going to be, you know, of the order of 512 to one, 512 megabytes to one gigabyte. So C4 is not going to be a limitation in terms of that. If we look at the reality of that, this is just a, a simple example I, I pulled out because this was a system that was using a one gigabyte heap. And on the right hand side, we've got Hotspot running Hazelcast um, as a, an application. And then on the left hand side, sorry, the right hand side, we've got Zing running the same application. Now, the way that we monitor this is using a thing called jhiccup. And jhiccup is a simple tool that runs a thread alongside the application, doesn't interact with the application, and the thread literally spends most of its time asleep. So what it will do is it will sleep for one millisecond, and when it wakes up, it will look at the system timer and record the difference between when it thought it should have woken up and when it actually woke up. So if you get a garbage collection pause that kicks in whilst the thread is asleep, it will wake up later than it expected, and it can measure the length of the pause of that garbage collection cycle. So this gives us a very clear picture of the effect of the JVM and everything below it on your application. So this is not measuring the latency of being able to process a transaction in terms of the work your application or microservice does. It's about how the JVM works underneath. So if you look at this as an example, if you were using this as a microservice, on the left hand side with hotspot you're going to get be getting very consistent pauses in the sort of 25 to 40 millisecond range so that's just one of your microservices that's going to be introducing a, a 25 to 40 millisecond latency pause if you look at the right hand side with zing that basically flatlines out so it goes down to i'd have to change the scale on this but i'm guessing it's going to be less than five milliseconds in terms of latency and a lot of that's actually down to underlying things below the JVM itself. So you can eliminate a lot of the latency that's, that's a result of your microservice and or as a result of garbage collection on the microservice so that you can then eliminate latency across the transaction processing and, and make this SLA that you've got for the application itself. 
In terms of the Falcon JIT compiler, um, what we've done there is, as I said, replace the C2 JIT compiler with one that's based on an open source project called LLVM. What we did was we, we took that, it's really designed for the, the back end of, of static compilers, and we integrated it into the JVM, made it work with things like garbage collector and the rest of the JVM. Great advantage of this is it's a really nice clean modular design, which makes it very easy to add new features to it and to look at how to improve performance. We also find that because lots of people are working on LLVM, we pick up a lot of performance improvements every time we refresh from the, the core um, project. Another thing um, in terms of the results we get from this is that we can get some really substantial improvements in, in certain cases. So one of the areas that um, it really excels in that we've seen a lot of is the use of vector operations. So the AVX, AVX2, AVX512 instructions that you get on the modern Intel processors. We're able to exploit those with a lot more code patterns than you would with traditional JIT compilation. And in fact, um, a really good example of that was the Apache Arrow project. And what they found was that when they were doing some testing, they actually found a 50% improvement in performance on Zing over Hotspot. And the reason, way they found that was that they, they were doing some IO intensive code and they decided to rewrite it in C++ to see whether they could figure out how the, the actual underlying instructions could work in a better way and what they found when they compared the code that the Zing JIT compiler was producing was it was basically the same as they were getting from a natively compiled C++ code which actually makes a lot of sense because LLVM as I said is is very much the sort of back end of a static compiler that could be used for C++ but that's a good example of where Zing can give you really good performance in terms of your your microservices as well okay so AOT versus JIT and this is something that does come up a lot when people talk about how to improve the performance of, of microservices. So what you need to think about in terms of microservices is what's the most important thing? Because there are two somewhat, somewhat orthogonal things that you need to think about. One is the speed of startup. How quickly can you spin up a service and have that service respond to requests so that could be a very important thing but then the other thing you need to think about is what is the speed of that service once it has actually got up and running because are you in a situation where your services are going to be very very short-lived or are you dealing with services which are slightly longer lived and therefore you're going to have you, you want better performance from overall so AOT, ahead of time compilation, static compilation, can provide very fast startup. So that, that is very good for microservices. If you want to spin up a new microservice, the fact that you can get it running at full speed very quickly is obviously an advantage. But there is a downside to this. AOT, ahead of time compilation, is much more limited in terms of the optimizations that it can apply to the code that it generates that's going to be run for the whole lifetime of that service. Things like less aggressive method inlining and escape analysis. This is a result of the fact that Java being a dynamic language, not from the type perspective, but from the point of view of classes can be loaded and unloaded dynamically. When it comes to method inlining, static compilation can't always uh, inline a method because it can't guarantee that the method it's going to inline will be the one that will be used at runtime because you could dynamically load a different class with a different method implementation. So JIT compilation, because it has a, a complete view of a running system, knows exactly which method is being called, so it can inline that method more aggressively. Same with escape analysis. The other thing that, that's really big in terms of improving performance through a JIT compiler is speculative optimizations, and they just don't work with ahead of time compilation. So speculative optimizations are things like where you've got uh, an if statement and the profiling shows that the code is only going through the true branch of the if statement because of the way the application is working you know the false branch is something that's a, a very um, unlikely situation and you're not seeing it in a typical application so you can optimize based on the fact that the code is only ever going to go through the true branch and as long as that holds true then you get better performance so aot can't do that because of course what would happen is at runtime if you only had the true branch there you couldn't then go and do anything in the false branch. With JIT compilation, even if this code goes through the false branch at some point later on, you can do what's called a de-optimization because a trap handler will kick in and say, oh, okay, we've, we've 
incorrectly compile this code, throw it away and restart. So it, that works with JIT, but doesn't work with AOT. JIT gives, gives much better performance when it's up and running. Um, the drawback from a microservice point of view is the warm up time, the thing that we see with, with Java applications. It takes time to go through the um, interpretive mode, C1 compile profiling, C2 compile code, or G, uh, Falcon compile code. So, what do we do to solve that? Well, we have a thing called ReadyNow. And what ReadyNow does is it says, okay, run your microservice and get it running with a representative load, and then create a profile. And the profile consists of a number of pieces of information, all the classes which are loaded at that point, all the classes which are initialized, all the JIT profiling data that was generated during the C1 compiled code that was running before it got Falcon compiled, and the deoptimizations that were necessary because the assumptions about a speculative optimization proved to be false. So what we then do is we use that profile when the system starts up to eliminate much of the JVM warm up problem. So rather than having to, to actually wait for the system to warm up, you say, okay, load all the classes that we can load, initialize all the classes that we can initialize, use that JIT profiling data and the deoptimizations to compile the methods that we need straight away and with the optimum level of performance. That then allows you to run at pretty much about 98% of the performance you would have had when the profile was taken. To make that even faster, because it still does involve some compilation ahead of getting the application running, to make that even faster, we now use what's called code stashing, where we record all of the compiled code when we take the profile, and then we're able to use that when we start the application or the, the service up again, we can say, oh, okay, if the method hasn't changed, because and it hopefully shouldn't because it's part of a container. If the method hasn't changed in terms of being re-implemented and the profiling data matches, which it probably should, then we can simply use the cached code rather than having to recompile it. And that can reduce the uh, effect of the, the um, startup time by about 80%. So that, that really is a good thing in terms of performance for getting your application starting, or your sorry, your services starting quickly, but still benefiting from the fact that you've got much uh, higher performance than AOT compiled code. Again, little graph here in terms of the effect. So this is just a simple application that we tested where you can see that before using ReadyNow, you've got this up and down graph, and this is latency. So you've got high latency that gradually dies down as the application warms up, it goes through a number of phases in terms of compilation, deoptimization, recompilation, and so on. And then from using ReadyNow, we see a nice flat line in terms of latency so that we get our application up and running really nice and quickly. In terms of Zing in the cloud, um, in the past, we have had issues because um, we had a thing called the Zing system tools. Now this is really powerful because it's designed for you know long running systems that need lots of memory. And so we could actually do memory management at the operating system level to optimize even further for the way that the JVM works. For things like microservices, you don't want that because if you're deploying into a container, you don't want to have to then deploy other software on top of the underlying host operating system. So now, since August of last year, Zing system tools are not installed by default. You can still use those if you want really, really big heaps, but I'm guessing most microservices are not going to need a heap of a, over one terabyte. So now you don't need Zing system tools, which means that the Zing JVM looks exactly like any other JVM. You can deploy it into your container, you can create a layer within your image, and it's as simple as that. You can then also put your ReadyNow profiles in there. So when you start up, profiles are there, get the quick start of your service, and everything's all contained in that in a nice, easy to use way. So just to conclude, um, basically, Microservices, as I said, well suited to modern software development. Agile, continuous integration, continuous deployment. We use Kubernetes to deploy, that should be, not to de deploy, manage and scale our applications. So that's the magic that happens above the container part of things. When we look at Java microservices, they're different to a normal application. So we need to consider the speed of the startup. That's really quite important because we're going to be spinning up new instances of service potentially. But we need to consider the speed of the startup versus the maximum speed versus the latency. So these are three 
quite distinct performance considerations. And when you're looking at the overall design of your microservices architecture, you do need to think about getting that balance right. So again, as I say, Zing is ideal for Java, Java microservices with Kubernetes, superior heat management through C4, and both Falcon and ReadyNow technology for both fast startup and making your application run even faster and getting those services running fast within the container. So that is pretty much the presentation. So what I'm going to do, I've got a few minutes left. I'm going to switch over to the Q&A. And OK, so let's go to questions and see what we've got. So does Azul JDK 1.8 support TLS version 1.3? Ah, yes. Um, that's a good question. So yes, uh, in terms of Zulu, which is our open JDK build, that definitely does support TLS 1.3. I would have to check on Zing. I think it does, but I'm not 100% sure. So I will check that to make sure that um, that is the case. Uh, okay. Um, our cloud architect is very keen on using Amazon ECS over managed Kubernetes due to perceived simplicity. Many of our developers prefer Kubernetes due to the feature richness, but I do understand the architect's concern over complexity. What are your thoughts on using a cloud vendor specific container platform versus Kubernetes if the organization has put their eggs more firmly in a single cloud platform basket? Okay, so yes, I, I understand the question there. So essentially the, the power of Kubernetes is that it is um, cloud agnostic. So all the major cloud providers and pretty much all the cloud providers support Kubernetes. So you can use it on Azure from Microsoft, you can use it on Amazon, AWS, you can use it on Oracle, you can use it on IBM, Google, obviously, they, they all support it. So I think that question, it really comes down to whether you believe that you're ever going to move off AWS. And if you are, how much work would it require to migrate away from using the cloud specific way of doing things versus Kubernetes? So it's it's a kind of decision about your deployment um, in terms of whether you think it makes um, more sense to do that. Because if you're committed to the idea of using AWS, then using the, the cloud specific way of doing things is, is, you know, that could work very well for you. But obviously Kubernetes is the, the most popular one at the moment. Uh, does Falcon JIT compiler take much time when compiling bytecodes? Um, it takes, I, I mean, again, it's, it's one of the, that's a bit of a sort of how long is a piece of string question. But um, essentially, we try to make it run uh, the same speed as um, you would get with C2. Because we do a bit more optimization, it may take a little bit longer to generate the optimized code. But I don't think it's the kind of difference in speed that would would really cause your application to perform a lot slower than it does on another platform and certainly we've not seen anybody who's come back and said oh you know the compilation times are so significantly longer that we can't use falcon because it's it's way longer than c2 what we find is that um people normally just say oh this is great because the code that's being generated is faster than the code that we would have got from C2. So the performance impact is, is much better in that sense. Once it's compiled, then you don't have to worry about that. And as I said, the idea with using ready now is a lot of it can be avoided by using compile stashing. So you don't have to um, worry about recompiling that code. Uh, what is AOT? AOT is a head of time compilation. So it's static compilation where you're doing the compiling before you run the application. We use Zulu JDK. Do you recommend us to move to Zing? Do we see significant performance improvement in Zing and Zulu? Um, yes, um, I would certainly recommend moving to Zing, <laughs> putting my salesman hat on. Um, but no, being being more realistic, um, obviously you need to look at what application you're running. If latency is an issue, if garbage collection is an issue, then definitely Zing will will alleviate that problem. From the point of view of the overall performance of the application, you would typically see an improvement in performance. I can't really give you a percentage. That will be as a result of using Falcon and getting uh, more heavily optimized code that's being generated. So yeah, there are a number of reasons why you would definitely want to, to move to Zing over Zulu if performance is an issue for your application. Uh, right. Okay. 
to which versions of Azul, Zing, Java are these improvements added, e.g.? Okay, so we have two versions of Zing at the moment. One is Zing, uh, basically JDK 8, and the other is Zing JDK 11. Okay, uh, how's the license model of Zing JVM from different normal deployments? Okay, so in terms of uh, the way that we do licensing, we do it on a subscription basis. So it would be how many um, versions of Zing you deploy. For microservices, um, we can be flexible on that. So uh, we could provide, you know, we could negotiate on how you would actually want to use that in terms of microservices. So if you were doing a single application with you know, say 10 microservices, we wouldn't necessarily need to count 10 instances of Zing in that. So that, that would be open to negotiation. Uh, what pl platforms are supported by Zing? So Zing runs on Intel architecture, so your typical x64, 64-bit architecture, and it only runs on Linux. And that's because of the way that we do the, the memory um, handling at the sort of low level with that. Um, we could potentially move it to Windows. We've looked at it from a, a technical point of view, but um, we don't have enough demand to move it to Windows. So at the moment, Zing only runs on Linux um, on the Intel architecture. How does C4 affect throughput? Um, okay, yeah, so that's a good question because obviously if we're doing concurrent garbage collection with the application threads, then you would typically see a small degradation in terms of throughput because the garbage collection is having to be done at the same time. But what we've now found is you see by using Falcon, because we can achieve better optimization of the generated JIT code, that is more than enough to offset the loss of throughput that you would get compared to Hotspot. So if you look at Hotspot, you will get pauseless and you will typically get either the same or better performance in terms of throughput, even though we are doing concurrent garbage collection with that. Uh, is Zing complete replacement for standard JVM? Yes, it is, because it's, it's the JVM. The rest of the JDK, all of the other parts with the libraries and so on, is still open JDK, but we replace the JVM, and so it is a complete replacement for that. Uh, does uh, so does us all support fibers? Well, fibers, I assume by that you mean Project Loom, which is the idea of lightweight threads being added to the, the JVM. That's still a research project, so it's not part of OpenJDK yet, as and when it becomes part of um, the OpenJDK hotspot JVM, we will obviously take though that work and we will integrate it into Zing. So whenever, which JDK it becomes part of. Um, what is Zing pricing model if you have a heterogeneous software stack running on large clusters? Um, again, we do it through a subscription model, so based on instances of Zing. Um, if you're interested in that, have a look at our website. Um, we explain that um, in more detail than I have time for now because I'm running out of time. Um, okay. Um, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so our pricing, again, because uh, another question come up on that, is around per server. So we count the server as being two CPUs, um, so two sockets. Uh, we don't care about how many cores are there. So it's it's two CPU sockets is what we class as a server, and then it's, it's however many servers there are there. Um, it's more important than JIT and AOT in case of performance. Okay, I don't quite understand that question. Um, does Zing have optimizations for dynamic typing languages on JVM such as Groovy or Clojure? Um, it has the same optimizations. So this was about, this is about dynamic type dynamic type languages. Um, it has the same optimizations that you get in Hotspot. So um, one of the things that um, Hotspot compiler did to make it easier to compile dynamic type languages into bytecodes was to include the invoke dynamic bytecode in JDK seven and there's some work going on with dynamic class file constants in JDK I think it's 12 that that was introduced in. So obviously because we we match all of that, then we do the same thing as the open JDK source code. From the point of view of how we then translate those bytecodes into native instructions, it will work in exactly the same way as it does on Hotspot. Um, are there any effect to move my application from JDK 9 plus to from JDK 8? Um, not really. I mean, from a, a Zing point of view, there's, there's no um, differences that you need to worry about. Obviously, 
from the Java perspective, there's the whole idea of modularity that needs to be um, addressed, um, but that's not a Zing specific thing. Okay, we're going to take a look at that. Is Azul JDK cheaper compared to Red Hat? Um, that's, I don't know. Um, I don't know what Red Hat charge for their JDK. Um, so I don't think I can really answer that question. Um, okay, so we have reached the top of the hour. Um, and I think I've got to the end of the questions that are on there at the moment. So I would just like to say thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been enjoyable. One thing I would say is there is a recording of this will be available afterwards and the slides will also be sent to everybody who was on the presentation. So thank you very much. <laughs>